afternoon. Thanks for uh, attending the, the uh, second Shively lecture. This lecture is a uh, series is funded by the Class of 1950 Museum Endowment in recognition of the significant contribution made by the endowment by the Shively Trust. Vice Admiral Ralph Shively was a highly decorated naval aviator. Graduated a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, Class of 1933. He was designated a naval aviator in 1937. He participated in World War II operations against the Japanese at New Guinea, Saipan, Guam, the Palaos, and the Philippines. He was awarded the Navy Cross and Distinguished Flying Cross. And now we have Dr. John, John Gordon, our lecturer today. He's a senior foreign policy researcher at the RAND Corporation following a 20-year U.S. Army career. Since joining RAND, he has participated in and led numerous studies for the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Department of the Army and Navy. He's an adjunct faculty member at Georgetown and George Mason Universities, where he teaches graduate level courses on counterinsurgency and military operations. He's authored numerous articles on military subjects in a variety of professional journals and the World War II history book, Fighting for MacArthur, Navy and Marine Corps, De Desperate uh, Defense of the Philippines. He has a bachelor's degree in history from the Citadel, master's in international relations from St. Mary's University in San Antonio, MBA from Marymount University and a PhD in public policy from George Mason University. And we are going to start taping this so we make this available to the alumni uh, and other uh, folks who aren't able to be here in Annapolis. So uh, when we do have the Q&A period, if you just make sure you raise your hand and say it pretty loudly so that we can make sure we get that recorded. And John, the floor is yours. Very good, sir. Thanks Thank you. Thank you me. very much for the introduction. Appreciate it. Great to be here today. Um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the book we'll discuss, Fighting for MacArthur, it's uh, two years old as of last month. Um, uh, this is my 26th book presentation on the book. You know, so getting into the, the habit of, of what I want to say on these things. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the background on, on, um, on why I did this book is um, uh, the fighting in the Philippines was largely an army campaign. You know, the, I'll show you some numbers in a few minutes. It was largely American army and Philippine army. Uh, and I, I, for many years, I was researching this campaign. I was writing articles about it in, in like Army Magazine, Military Review, some of the standard Army mags. Um, and I, I got to know in the, in the 80s and 90s a lot of survivors of this campaign, the fighting in the Philippines, most of whom had been prisoners of the Japanese. And as I would get to know these Army vets of the campaign, they would say things to me like, hey, how would you like to hear about what the 4th Marines did? You know, what, you know there, I was in POW camp. A couple of my really good, good friends in POW camp that I stayed in contact with all these years are Navy guys. You know, they could help you learn the Navy part of the story. So I did. I said, sure, I'd love to learn what the Navy and the Marine Corps did. So I started to build up a body of knowledge about that, wrote a couple of articles like for Naval History Magazine, you know, here at, at Annapolis. And it occurred to me that nobody had done a book that focused on the role of the Navy and the Marine Corps in this largely Army fight in the Philippines. So back about four years ago, I asked the Naval Institute Press here, would you guys be interested in a book that would focus on what the sailors and Marines did? And they said, absolutely do it. So I worked on it for about three years, and as I said, the book came out in October of 2011. Um, what more appropriate than having a former Army guy, you know, tell the story of the Navy and Marine Corps? You know, I come from a very Navy family. My, my dad was a career Naval Intelligence officer, enlisted in, an officer. Um, my, um, my wife started her military career as an Army Medical Service Corps officer and did an inter-service transfer into the Navy. My firstborn son spent six years in the Navy, four on the Truman, shoveling uranium in one of the reactor rooms <laughs> on the Truman for a number of years. And he's now at George Mason getting, um, getting a, a, a double E degree because he found he really enjoyed that in the Navy. You know, and my dad, my Navy dad, you know, he was always giving me a hard time about the Army and, you know, just, you know, just abuse and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And usually it, I would just ignore it. You know, just, it, it, you know, when I was about junior at the Citadel, he realized I was a lost cause. I was going in the Army. He wasn't going to change that. But, you know, there was a few things that Dad would occasionally say that would kind of dig especially deep. And there was one line he used, you know, he was he just absolutely disgusted with me. No, I was a lost cause. I was going in the Army. One night he said to me at the dinner table, he said, you know, son, Neanderthal man never really became extinct. He went in the army. That was the one that kind of hurt, okay? But anyway, former army guy telling the story, and that's the background of how the book came about. 
Real quick background for you guys. Some of you are very familiar with the history. Southeast Asia, Australia, you know, today this says Indonesia. Back in 1940, 41, this would have read Dutch East Indies, Netherlands East Indies. Uh, Malaya, Singapore, here's French Indochina, which really is the catalyst to actually put us on a collision course with the Japanese. And then over here is the Philippines, we've had since 1898. Um, in the 1930s, the American Congress passed uh, the Tidings McDuffie Law uh, in 1934 that said we're going to give the Philippines their independence in 1946. So in, when World War II breaks out, we were in the process of getting the Philippines ready to become an independent nation. World War II gets in the way. Of course, what really brings us to a collision with the Japanese is that in 1940, after the fall of France, the Japanese start a very predatory approach. You know, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit because, you know, France has fallen to the Nazis. Um, you know, the British had their back up against the wall, fighting you know, the Germans in, in, the, in the European theater. They can't spare much for the Far East. So the Japanese realize there's a lot of easy pickings in the Far East. They descend on what is now Vietnam, what's then French Indochina, taking the northern half in 1940. We start into you know, some economic sanctions against them. In July of 1941, they move into the southern half of Vietnam. The French Vichy authorities are basically uh, bullied by the Japanese to let the Japanese in. And when they go into southern Vietnam, we, the British and the Dutch, freeze their assets and embargo oil. And what that really does, it pushes the Japanese up against the wall with our thumb on their windpipe. Their, the clock is ticking because they've got about two years of oil stockpile and that's it. So they have basically two choices, either back down, acquiesce to our demands, or come out swinging. And we know this is in July. We know in December they come out swinging in a major way. During the intervening months, after years of having minimal forces in the Philippines, for decades, minimal Army and Navy forces in the Philippines, there's this mad dash to reinforce the Philippines in an attempt to deter the Japanese. So all during the summer and fall of 1941, there's an attempt mostly by the Army to get a whole lot more stuff in the Philippines, grow the Philippine armed forces as fast as they can, the Japanese catch us and go to war before we're ready. So that's the strategic situation in the Far East when uh, war begins. Here's detail in the Philippines. You can see the uh, population in 19, but today the Philippines is about 100 million people. The population has grown enormously since the 1940s. But about 17 million Filipinos, you can see the numbers of military people that were assigned out in the Far East. Um, uh, the Army was planning by April of 1942 to have about 60,000 American Army personnel in the Philippines. And the Philippine Army, which was growing rapidly, but was still very poorly trained, very poorly equipped in December 1941. The Philippine Army was supposed to about double by the spring of 1942. This is the naval command in the Far East, which was known as Asiatic Fleet. Okay? Navy and Marine Corps have been operating in the Far East before the Army, because the Army presence in the Philippines really begins after 1898 when we take the Philippines from Spain. Navy and Marine Corps have been operating along the Chinese coast since the 1850s, you know, even before the American Civil War. So here's the strength of the Asiatic Fleet when the war begins, um, you know, including some Filipino naval reservists. Most of these Marines are guys who have been pulled out of China at the 11th hour. Because as the war warnings are coming, it's looking increasingly likely the Japanese are going to attack. They start pulling um, Navy ships like the River Gun. How many of you guys have ever seen the great Steve McQueen movie, The Sand Pebbles? You know, great movie about the Navy operating on the rivers of China in the 1920s and 1930s. They start pulling those gunboats. Out of, out of China to get them back over to the Philippines. They start evacuating the Marines over to the Philippines from China, where the 4th Marines have been since 1927 in Shanghai, protecting Americans in Shanghai. Navy had two big bases in the Philippines. Um, here's Manila. Here's the Bataan Peninsula. I'll show you more maps of that later. Here's Olongapo, the famous Navy base, which the Filipinos are now starting to allow us to come back into because of bad Chinese behavior. Navy's going back to Olongapo. Um, inside Manila Bay, just outside the middle, about seven miles around the curve of the bay, was the Cavite Navy Yard. That was then the big American Navy. It was the Spanish Navy base, 
This is where Dewey had defeated the Spanish fleet in 1898. That was the main U.S. Navy base in the Philippines before the war, not Longapo. Longapo Subic Bay was like a secondary base. Main base was at Cavite. I'll show you some pictures of it. It wasn't very, very large. So that, that gives you the numbers and what the strategy was. Now, I already mentioned some of this kind of a timeline for you guys. Things get to the crisis point here. Douglas MacArthur had retired from the United States Army in 1937. He was hired by the Philippine government to be their military advisor to get their army ready for independence in 1946. Well, when this crisis comes up with the Japanese occupying Vietnam, MacArthur is brought back on active duty initially as a three-star general, lieutenant general. So, you know, he's, he was returned in, to, do, to duty in July. He's put in command of something called USAPI, U.S. Army Forces Far East, and he starts interacting with the Navy from that point. War warning, you guys have seen the movie Tora, Tora, Tora. You remember in the movie, you know, the, like the week before Pearl Harbor, they send out that initial war warning, which, which then, you know, some people are embarrassed over because the Japanese didn't attack. Well, you know, Japanese attacked about 10 days later. Um, and you can see how very late it was when the 4th Marines and these gunboats were being pulled out of China. You know, they just barely make it to the Philippines in time. Uh, in fact, a couple hundred Marines didn't make it out. There were 200 Marines who were caught up in North China who did not get a chance to escape. They were captured on the first day of the war. They were like the embassy guard up in the northern part of the, of the country. Um, war begins at the Far East on 8 December in, in what is still a very controversial disaster today. The MacArthur, most of MacArthur's Army Air Force was caught on the ground by the Japanese nine hours after Pearl Harbor. Japanese plane, Navy planes, Japanese naval aircraft flying from Formosa, today's Taiwan, you know, made a massive raid on the Philippines. There was just confusion. There was misunderstanding. There was some poor training. There was inexperience. So the bottom line is nine hours after Pearl Harbor, most of the Army Air Force is caught on the ground. It gets the defense of the Philippines off to a terrible start. Um, Japanese, two days later, I'll show you some pictures of this, the Japanese devastate that Cavite Navy Yard because uh, Japanese are rapidly winning air superiority. They basically bomb out the Cavite Navy Yard on the third day of the war. They make their main landings on Luzon uh, in these dates. The army has to start falling back to Bataan. The siege of Bataan lasts about three months. Talk about what the sailors did there. And then finally, for about one more month after Bataan Falls, there's the siege of, uh, the siege of Corregidor when the campaign comes to an end. Um, when war breaks out, there are four four-star admirals in the Navy. The Navy was about 330, 340,000 sailors then, about what the Navy is today, in fact. Uh, we just didn't have any, as many admirals back then as we do. To, same thing with the Army. There are a lot more generals today than there were back then. There were only four four-star admirals. Um, Admiral uh, Stark was the chief of naval operations in Washington. In early 1942, he's succeeded by Admiral King, Ernest J. King. But Admiral Stark is the chief of naval operations. Admiral King is the commander-in-chief of the Atlantic Fleet. Admiral Kimmel is at Pearl Harbor with the Pacific Fleet. Of course, he's relieved a few days after Pearl Harbor. And Admiral Hart is the commander-in-chief of the very small Asiatic fleet out in the Philippines. I really came to respect this guy in the research. Uh, I, I think he has been tremendous. Of all the senior commanders in the Pacific, when the war starts, these war warning messages that are coming from Washington in mid to late November, Hart takes that stuff deadly, deadly serious. So of all the major commands out in the Pacific on, when war breaks out, the Asiatic fleet is without question the most prepared, but it's very small. He's got a very limited ability to contest the Japanese. So he stays in the Philippines until about Christmas Day, and he leaves by submarine to go down to Java to join most of the surface elements of this Asiatic fleet, which have gone south to Java. 16th Naval District, Admiral Rockwell, you got the second highest ranking Navy guy in the Philippines. When the war starts, he was at the Cavite Navy Yard when Japanese bombers arrived, personally led a lot of the rescue attempts. When MacArthur leaves Corregidor by PT boat in, November, in, in March, in mid-March, Admiral Rockwell goes with him. Okay, so he stays in the Philippines 
until MacArthur is evacuated. Senior Marine in the Philippines, Colonel Howard, you know, he was in command of the 4th Marines in Shanghai. You saw the dates there. The 4th Marines escaped from Shanghai just, you know, a week before war begins, less than a week before war begins. This is one of his battalion commanders, and this is the uh, Army two-star who commanded the fortress of Corregidor. Picture was taken on Corregidor about two months into the war. A lot of photos survived, even though we lost that campaign. A huge number of records that were, were destroyed and lost in the campaign. A lot of stuff has survived, including a lot of original photographs like this. So Colonel Howard was senior Marine in the Philippines, captured when the 4th Marines surrendered on Corregidor. Uh, interesting story, the whole time he was in POW camp, he thought he'd be in utter disgrace. Uh, he, 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 the only time the Marine Corps ever had a regiment destroyed in combat was when the 4th Marines surrendered. He thought he'd be in utter disgrace when he was released from prison camp at the end of the war. The Marine Corps didn't feel that way at all. He ends up retiring from the Marine Corps as a three-star general in the 1950s. So they kind of forgave him or understood that it wasn't his fault about losing the 4th Marines. Um, some of the ships, this is Admiral Hart's flagship. There were no battleships, there were no aircraft carriers in the Asiatic fleet. That's the USS Houston, uh, about a 10,000 ton, uh, 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, heavy cruiser. Of course, today, the combat power ships is measured by missiles. Back then, you measured the combat power ships by guns. This had about a thousand man crew, nine eight inch guns. Uh, you know, that was the largest American warship in the Western Pacific when the war starts. Um, the so-called four piper or flush deck destroyers, World War I air destroyers. Asiatic fleet had about 13 of these, had 13 of these when the war started. About half of them were sunk during the campaign, mostly down in the Dutch East Indies. Because when, when things get bad in the Philippines, the surface element of the Asiatic fleet largely heads south to fight alongside the Dutch and the, um, uh, and the British and the, and the Australians in the, in the Indies. So most of the larger surface ships head south while the Philippine campaign is going on. Um, if you guys saw the sand pebbles, that should look familiar to you. That's one of the river gunboats. Three of these were in, um, uh, in the Philippines. They fought in Manila Bay to support the army, protect the flanks of the army on the Bataan Peninsula. Uh, one of the, they, when, when the war warning came out, it was typhoon season in the South China Sea. Flat bottom, eight foot draft, and it's typhoon season. All right, I have copies of the pages. The logs of these things survived. They were evacuated from the Philippines. They're in the National Archives right now. I've, I've read through a lot of log entries and the voyages that these things made from Shanghai over to Manila Bay in typhoon season makes me glad I was an army guy because you know there's log entries about how we rolled 56 degrees to starboard and 40 degrees, 45 degrees to port. No thank you, okay? But so they amazingly made it across the South China Sea in typhoon season. I said, three of these fought in Manila. I got to know the exo of the Mindanao very, very well, retired as a captain, survived prison camp. He and his skipper were the only two of the seven officers on the ship that survived prison camp. Captain Nash, who ended up retired in, out in Coronado in California. I became a really good friend of him over the years. He was a big help to me as I was doing my research. Uh, his skipper, uh, uh, Commander McCracken, the skipper, who also survived prison camp, ended up retiring from the Navy. Navy as a rear admiral in the 1950s. Quail, my, three of these minesweepers were in Manila Bay. They had three inch guns on them. They were used for gunfire support, shooting at Japanese on shore, that kind of thing. We're gonna come back to the Quail. Remember that ship? We're gonna come back to that at the end of the presentation or toward the end of the presentation. The Navy left, not only did they leave some of these minesweepers and gunboats behind, I'll show you the PT boats in a minute. The largest ship to stay at Bataan during the campaign was this thing here, the Canopus. About a 600-man ship, about 6,000-ton submarine tender. Many of its crew fight on shore as infantry during the Bataan campaign. The reason they left the ship behind in Manila Bay, they were hoping that submarine operations could continue from Manila Bay as long as possible. So like subs coming up from Australia, they pull in Manila Bay, they need more torpedoes. Their torpedoes didn't work anyway early in the war. A lot of you guys know that. But they would pull in, Canopus would service them. It was berthed at Bataan. And like said many of its crew fought not only on Bataan as infantry, a lot of its crew fought on Corregidor's infantry as well. So probably about half the crew of this ship ended up with right, you know, fixed bayonets and rifles at one point of the campaign or another. They had six of these PT boats. That's the very famous, that, that's, uh, uh, I've got to know Admiral Buckley who was the skipper of the, he was a lieutenant at the time, the squadron commander of these PT boats. He stayed in the Navy as a, Navy used him, to, when he, he, he was a retiree recall, they used him for like ship inspection of new ships and stuff. 
you know, he was well into his 80s when he was still doing that. Uh, died a few years ago, a really great guy. That's his boat. Uh, that's the boat that MacArthur was evacuated from Corregidor on right there. But there were four PT boats that took Admiral Rockwell, uh, General MacArthur, and you know, key, MacArthur's family and other you know, key people were evacuated from Corregidor. They took him down to the southern Philippines. They flew into Australia. So the PT boats had their first combat experience in the Philippines. Um, Navy had some patrol wing, uh, patrol wing 10 had 28 of these PBY flying boats. Most of these are gone by the time the Batan campaign begins. They've either been shot down, strafed on the water by the Japanese, or they've been evacuated down to fight alongside the British and Dutch. Um, sailors back then were a lot more accustomed to landing operations and you know the rifle and bayonet kind of stuff than sailors today are. That's a picture taken from, on the Mindanao in the late 1930s. This is a landing party. You can see these guys have a mixture of Springfield rifles. There's some shotguns. Here, this guy's got a shotgun. And here's a Thompson submachine gun. Down here is another couple Thompson submachine guns. So it was not at all unusual, especially if you were in the Caribbean or the Asiatic fleet in Asia. Lots of sailors. You guys remember the great scene from the boarding action from the sand pebbles. I mean, sailors, they weren't well, well trained as infantry countrymen, but they had a lot more experience with the kind of stuff than, than uh, a typical sailor today would. Marines, you know, here's a, a detachment of the 4th Marines uh, in China before the war. You know, obviously, they're going through an inspection. Uh, notice the khaki uniforms, the World War I type steel pots. That's what they were wearing in early. In fact, you look at uh, early Pacific photos, the guys are dressed like this in khaki with the World War I helmets pretty much all the way up through the Battle of Midway. When the Marines land on Guadalcanal in, in August of 1942, they're wearing the, you know, the more modern type World War II uniforms. All the early war fighting, this is what these guys look like, in the, in the World War I helmets and all that. Um, another picture of Marines training Filipinos on Corregidor. That's uh, when the 4th Marines was, was posted to Corregidor. It was badly under strength. A lot of Army guys got added to it. A lot of Filipinos got added to it. By the time the final surrender on Corregidor, about one-third of the regiment's actually Marines. The other two-thirds are like sailors and Army guys and Filipinos. So here's a group of Marine NCOs teaching Filipinos how to use one of these water-cooled 30 caliber machine guns they had. Um, MacArthur, in addition to trying to get the Philippine Army ready, the MacArthur was also trying to build a small Philippine Navy. It was because the Philippines didn't have a lot of money, it was going to be PT boats. The, the hope was they'd have 50 of these before, by the time they became independent. In fact, when the, when the war starts, they had three. So these things fought us alongside the Navy, you know, the Navy ships in Manila Bay during the campaign. So an American submarine had back. Interestingly, when war begins, the way the Army was dashing stuff to the Philippines in an attempt to, to deter the Japanese in the summer and fall of 41, what the Navy was sending out to the Philippines was submarines. They were really increasing the submarine force of the Asiatic fleet. When war begins, there were 29 submarines based in the Philippines, the largest group of American submarines anywhere in the Navy, because they were supposed to be the Navy's main contribution to deterring the Japanese. Does anybody know what the problem the submarines had? I alluded to it a minute ago. Yeah. Torpedoes didn't work. It was the spring of 1943, a year and a half into the war, before they get the torpedo problem fixed. So these, it was very frustrating for these Asiatic fleet submarines. Multiple accounts of them getting hits on Japanese ships, no explosions. Typically, about one in four of the torpedoes was detonating you know, in this you know, er early campaign. And that, again, that problem lasted well over a year. And you know, first experienced by these boats in the Asiatic fleet. Here's the area the siege takes place, Manila Bay. Here's Manila. Here's that Cavite Navy Yard. Here's Subic. Right here, Longa Pose right there. Here's Bataan, and here's the other fortified islands that I'll show you about. This is the main area the campaign takes place in when the army has to fall back to the Bataan Peninsula. Blow up a Corregidor Island. Uh, very importantly, the Navy had some tunnels on Corregidor that they had built before the war. The most important one was Tunnel A Firm right there. You guys have heard about the pre-war attempts the Navy was making to break the Japanese codes. The single most successful, the single most important location the Navy had was Tunnel A firm on Corregidor. Um, there were the, the purple machine, the famous purple machine, that was the decoding machine that was breaking the Japanese diplomatic traffic. Uh, there were a total of eight purple machines. We had five, the Brits had three. One of those five that we had was here in this tunnel on Corregidor. They knew these guys could not fall into the hands of the Japanese. 
way too important. There were 75 guys operating there in this, this uh, intercept station. They were evacuated in three stages to Australia by submarine, about 25 guys, 25 guys, 25 guys. Uh, I have a great account by a guy who retired from the Navy as a commander. He was a petty officer first class in this campaign, one of the, the uh, intel yeomen. And when the last 25 guys were, getting, were waiting to be evacuated by submarine, he and the chiefs and the two or three remaining officers got together and they agreed that if the Japanese landed on Corregidor before they could be evacuated, their plan was they were going to shoot their own men and then shoot themselves rather than allow themselves to be taken prisoner by the Japanese because they knew they were that important. But they all make it to Australia. They set up shop again in Australia and continue their work against the Japanese codes. So they kept the machine until the third evacuation? Of the they kept as much of the equipment as they could as long as possible. And the, the, the purple machine got out. The purple machine, I think, I think it was taken out Cal, in the second lift that went out. They, they were all, the last group actually escaped the night Batan fell. A submarine arrived in Manila Bay and took the last 25 guys out the night Batan was surrendering. They couldn't actually get some of their final equipment into the, the hatches of the sub, so they had to leave it behind. And the Navy intel guys on Corregidor chopped the stuff up and make sure the Japanese would never be able to figure out what it was. But the purple machine itself was evacuated Australia. Defenses of Manila Bay, here's Corregidor and these other three much smaller forts. You know, here's Bataan up there. Uh, here's where the Canopus was set up, that subtender. Army and Navy minefields that were put in place in the summer of 1941 to close the entrance to Manila Bay. Uh, these are the kind of coast defense guns, early 1900s concrete coast uh, ar artillery emplacements the Army had. Sailors end up manning some of these later in the siege due to a lack of Army artillery guys, you know, sailors are used to man some of these Army gun batteries. Here's a 12-inch mortar battery firing 700-pound shells up to about seven or eight miles. Uh, that mortar battery on Corregidor fired in support of Navy infantry fighting on Bataan. I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, here, very quickly, right here is El Friali Island, Fort Drum. In the years before World War I, this was like a half-acre outcrop of rocks coming out of the harbor. Just like a big rocky mound, about half-acre in size. The Army engineers blasted it down to the waterline. It took 11 years to do the work, and the result was that, Fort Drum. 14-inch uh, naval-type gun turrets up here. 30-foot thick concrete walls, 20-foot thick concrete roof. Japanese could never knock this thing out. It's the most effective installation in Manila Bay. Uh, never, sorry, it's still there. It's a ruin now, but it's still there at the entrance to Manila Bay. A uh, few Marines served on this thing. The Marines provide the, the anti-aircraft machine gun detachment there. This is the Cavite Navy Yard where the Navy, uh, that na main Navy base was. I mentioned this is, we, we took this over um, from the Spanish. This is kind of the city of Cavite here. The Navy Yard's over there. Um, that's actually the Canopus. It's an August 1941 aerial photo. That's the Canopus, the subtender that was at Bataan. Those are the six PT boats that fight at Bataan, the ones that evacuate MacArthur and his family. This picture was taken about two months before the start of the war. Main, uh, crowded, crowded. Buildings close together wood and light metal buildings close together, not good when the bombs start falling. Um, there's another picture of the base showing uh, you know, the crowded conditions, mid-1930s picture taken of the Navy Yard. This is what does it in on the third day of the war, Japanese Navy bombers flying from Formosa, today's Taiwan. There's the, that's the, uh, the older Nell and the newer Betty bomber. Um, a big air battle takes place over Manila, about 50 zeros. They were flying from Formosa, not from carriers, escorting those Japanese Navy bombers. Army P-40s try to intercept them. Huge air battle takes place over Manila. The Japanese devastate the Army P-40s. They drive the surviving Army fighters away, and the result is this. War, I say in the book, I describe it, it's the worst damage ever inflicted on a U.S. Navy installation since the British burned the Washington Navy Yard in 1814. Basically, the Japanese, complete, they, they, between the fires and the bombs, they completely destroyed this Navy base in the Philippines. 
just some of the various pictures I managed to find, what it looked like. So the Siege of Bataan itself, they have to fall back. When the Japanese make their main landings, they fall back into Bataan. So the siege starts in early January. You can see when it starts, there's about 80,000 American and Filipino troops on Bataan, about another 7,000 on Corregidor and these other harbor forts. This is the number of Navy Marine Corps people that were in the area when the siege starts. Um, First battles take place up here. Japanese start driving the Americans and Filipinos back to their second defensive line. Just as the Americans are falling back to the second defensive line, the Japanese start making amphibious landings along, battalion-sized landings along the coast of Bataan. At a desperate point in the campaign, just as the armies were treating, they had no reserves at all. Everyone was committed to try to reform the line. So when Japanese land down here, the only unit nearby is the Naval Battalion, which had been formed exactly two weeks before the Japanese landed. 600 guys in the Naval Battalion, about 75 Marines, and the rest are sailors. They get committed immediately against this Japanese landing force. They fight the Japanese to a standstill. I showed you those mortars from Corregidor were firing 700-pound shells in support of the sailors. When I did a lot of my research for this, I, I made multiple trips to the MacArthur Memorial down in Norfolk. A lot of stuff about Douglas MacArthur there. They have captured Japanese diaries from this campaign. You know, a lot of American records were evacuated. Some captured Japanese records were evacuated before the final surrender. The diaries of a number of Japanese soldiers who fought against the Navy's infantry down here are at the MacArthur Memorial, all been translated. And it, the Japanese did not realize that they were fighting mostly sailors in this ground battle. It's very interesting what the Japanese sa soldiers say in their diaries. You know, these, these were taken off the dead bodies of Japanese soldiers. There's two themes that are very consistent in the diaries of these Japanese troops. One, the Americans are utterly fearless. You know, they, they, they appear to be completely fearless in the way they're fighting. And second, this is a re repeated theme, the Americans are using very, very strange infantry tactics. <laughs> I have often thought, and actually I've seen writings by Marine sergeants who survived this fight. You know, picture yourself, picture one of your E-5s who's got a squad of eight or nine sailors, you know, as his squad. Think about that for a minute. You know, you, you, you're, you have to have a lot of sympathy for those Marines. In that situation. They fought the Japanese to a standstill. Army guys came in. They completely wiped out that Japanese landing. Again, this naval battalion had been formed two weeks earlier. Whenever Rockwell leaves in March with MacArthur, Captain Hoffel becomes the senior Navy guy left behind. He, he's captured on Corregidor. He's one of only three Navy captains captured in the entire war. The governor of Guam was a captain. So when, he, when Guam fell on the third day of the war, Captain McMillan su surrendered Guam. The senior Navy doctor in the Philippines was a captain, Captain Davis. So those three Navy captains are the only three Navy 06s to fall into enemy hands during the whole war. Um, Admiral, uh, he, he retires from the Navy as a rear admiral in the 1950s, Admiral Ho Admiral, uh, Captain Hoffel. End of early April, Bataan Falls. You can see that uh, you know, there's probably about 75,000 Americans and Filipinos who are taken prisoner. You guys probably heard of the infamous Bataan Death March. About 5,000 Americans and Filipinos die on the Death March. Um, and uh, the, uh, most of the Navy and Marine guys managed to get to Corregidor Island, but there's a few Marines who are like, running a radar, a very important radar that the Marines have on Bataan. These guys end up captured by the Japanese. So there are about 70 Marines on the Death March, which is you know, overwhelmingly the American Army. Then that brings you to the final part of the Philippine campaign, you know, the siege of Corregidor. Again, here's Corregidor, here's that concrete battleship, here's the other two forts the Army had. This is a diagram taken from the Japanese official history volume on the Philipp fighting in the Philippines. That sh shows how once they took Bataan, they brought up uh, about 150 artillery pieces, about 120 artillery pieces down to shell the fortified islands, plus repeated bombing attacks. Uh, a, a thing to note is the, Amer the, the Army, Navy, Marine Corps guys on Corregidor they are subjected to the, most, the worst artillery and air attack bombardment of any American troops anywhere in World War II. You know, because it goes on for about 27 days as the Japanese are prepping the island before their invasion. 
Uh, they land on this, what was called the tail of Corregidor down here. Uh, uh, they land on the night of May 5th, it's bitter, bitter fighting. It's mostly sailors and Marines fighting against the Japanese when they land on this, the tail of Corregidor here. Over here, I'm gonna come back to this in a minute. This is Fort Hughes, one of the fortified islands. I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. Um, General Wainwright makes the decision to surrender on the morning of the 6th of May. Japanese land on the night of the 5th, with about 12 hours of fighting. Wainwright makes the decision to surrender. That's him giving his surrender broadcast uh, from Manila, you know, calling on the American and Filipino units in the southern Philippines to throw in the towel and surrender. Um, you can see what the final casualties were. Japanese took about 12,500 prisoners. By this point in the campaign, a third of those are sailors and Marines. So the, the garrison is very heavily Navy and Marine Corps in the last part of the campaign. About a third of those are sailors and Marines who were taken prisoner. You can see the number of Americans and Filipinos that were killed, number of Japanese who were killed in the final battle for um, the final battle for Corregidor. Not everybody surrendered. Not everybody surrendered. Wainwright surrendered at noon on May 6th. Fort Hughes. There's about 700 sailors and Marines, about 300 Army guys on Fort Hughes. Sailors are manning coastal defense guns. Sailors are manning beach defense positions. They're, they're, they're doing whatever they're, they have to do. The skipper of the quail, Commander Morell, John Morell, I got to know very, very well over the years. That night, Japanese creditor surrenders at noon on May 6th. That evening, he's on the island. Japanese haven't occupied Fort Hughes yet. They haven't come there. He assembles as many of his crew of his minesweepers as possible. He says, look, you guys have got to make a choice. Japanese aren't here yet. They're going to be here tomorrow. They're going to be occupying the island tomorrow, and we have to surrender. I'm not going to. I've got down at the dock, I've got a 40-foot motor whaleboat. The chiefs have loaded a bunch of guns and fuel and supplies and food in the whaleboat. You guys can stay here or and surrender to the Japanese when they arrive tomorrow, or you can come with me. 18 of them decide to go with him. So the surrender's at noon, about 10 o'clock that night, out, you know, 10 hours after the surrender, under cover of darkness, they 18 guys get in this motor whale boat, and they go right out over the top of the minefield, and they turn south. They sail at night, they hide ashore in day. They sail at night, they hide a short day. When they're running out of food, running out of gas, they'll pull into some native village, trying to barter for food. Hey, you guys have a little bit of fuel you can give us? We've got some, you know, we've got some goodies we can give you. You know, you'd like to make a trade. Please don't turn us into the Japanese. Please don't turn. So they keep sailing south, sailing south, sailing south. One month later, on June 6th, 1942, 2,100 miles to the south, they're chugging into Darwin Harbor in Darwin, Australia. They pull up to the dock. Morell gets out of the boat. There's some Australian military people. He tells them, hey, I'm Commander John Morell, uh, former skipper of the minesweeper Quail. Me and my men just sailed here from Manila Bay. And uh, what would you like us to do? And the Australians look at him and say, you sailed 2,000 miles in that? OK, you know, we've heard BS before, but this takes the Australians arrested them. Okay, they thought they were a bunch of American deserters who cooked up a story. Morell is beside himself, he can't believe it, and he demands to see the senior American army officer in Darwin, who happens to be an army West Point colonel, okay, West Point graduate colonel. Um, the colonel comes down there, starts talking to Morell, starts quizzing him about things, and what convinces the colonel that this guy is legit he can rattle off all the scores of the Army-Navy game for about the last 10 years. So he tells the Australians, let them go. <laughs> there they are. That's them. Okay. John Morell, right here, became a good friend of mine over the years. The story I just told you guys, retired Rear Admiral Morell, told me that story at his kitchen table of his farm in Southwest Virginia in early 1992, right after his 89th birthday. He lived until 2000, he, he lived until 97, he died at the age of 94. They said he retired from the Navy as a rear admiral, became one of my great friends over the years as I was researching this story. 
about Moreau? Yeah, I, it, 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 uh, there needs to be one. Make a great movie, in fact. Um, just to summarize for you guys, uh, biggest military defeat the United States has ever suffered, the campaign in the Philippines. The American public at the time was quite proud of it because the guys in the Philippines held out as long as they did. Some of the numbers for you, uh, 21,000 Americans taken prisoner in the Philippines, including that number of sailors and Marines. If you were a Dutchman captured on Java, if you were an Australian captured in Singapore, if you were a Brit captured at Hong Kong, if you're an American captured in the Philippines, the odds were about the same. When the war ends in late 1945, summer of 1945, about one out of three of you is not going to have made it. One out of every three Allied prisoners of the Japanese did not survive. So you can see what the figures were. About a third of the Marines, about a quarter of the sailors don't make it through Japanese captivity for a whole bunch of different reasons. I think it's important that Americans remember this also. Most of the soldiers on Bataan were Filipinos, not Americans, mostly Filipinos. And when the Japanese uh, took Bataan and Corregidor, you can see by June, Bataan falls in April, Corregidor falls in June, uh, I mean in May, I'm sorry, in May. So you see by June, there's about 55,000 Filipinos. They segregated them from the Americans. They separated the Filipinos from the Americans. There's about 55,000 Philippine Army guys in uh, prison camps in central Luzon. Right before Christmas 1942, they paroled the Filipinos. They said, go back to your town, go back to your village. We're going to be watching you. We're going to be watching you. When we trouble out of you guys, go home. And you can see how many of them had died in that prison camp before the Japanese let them go. So it's important for us Americans to keep that in mind. It was a lot of fun doing the story. Uh, like I said, it was, uh, uh, I think it kind of completes the narrative of, because no, no book had been devoted before to what the sailors and marines did in this campaign. So um, uh, I think this is good, and, and you can tell I got to know a lot of great people. My one regret, my one bitter regret is in my busy life, I wish I could have done this book 10 years earlier, because if I had gotten this book out 10 years earlier, the majority of these great old guys that I knew had still been around. I probably got to know 50 or 60 of them over in the 1980s and 1990s. I, I think I can count on one hand now the number that are still alive because the World War II vets are getting really old now. They're really, really old. So um, uh, I'm still in contact with a, with a guy who's a private in the 4th Marines. He was right there on the beaches at Corregidor when the Japanese landed on Corregidor. He is the A, a Company, 1st Battalion, 4th Marines. He's the last guy left from that company, the absolute last survivor of that company. He lives in Oklahoma. Is he still able to travel? I, well, no, he can't travel. He's 92. But I tell you, he's very alert. I just came from one four. That was my last station. And when they get back from this deployment, they would love to have him. But yeah, no, he's a, 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 a company. Uh, yeah. He was right there. He was in a bayonet fight with a Japanese soldier when they came ashore in Corregidor. I'm sorry? Alpha Raiders, that's what we call them. Yeah. I was an Alpha Company commander, but yeah, they'd love to have him. Yeah, great, great guy named Jack Warner. I mentioned him. Uh, later that night when they were fighting Japanese, he got shot through one of the legs and he was pulled into that Navy radio intercept tunnel where the code breakers had been. That's where he was when he was taken prisoner. He was, you know, wounded in that tunnel when the Jap you know, when the surrender flag went up at noon the next day. So, you know, you get to know a lot of these great guys. And I said, I would just wish I could have gotten the book out earlier because a lot more of them, you know, would have still been alive when that happened. Um, I'm, I know I'm a little bit over, but, but uh, uh, you know, uh, again, any, any questions, any thoughts from you guys? Sir, please. Uh, uh, one question, you mentioned uh, Filipino reservists, Navy reservists, yep. were they mess men and stewards? So, some were. Some were mess men. Others were just doing general duty kind of, kind of personnel. Um, have any of you guys ever seen the, the World War II movies? The story of the PT boats, they were expendable. It's a John Wayne movie. If you look at that movie, you'll see a Filipino that's among the, the, uh, the PT boat crews. So not only were they mess men, they would you know, assign them to, you know, to some of the smaller ships. Uh, they, they, uh, they, they were the crews of a lot of the small tenders and yard craft that the Navy had, you know, operating in Subic and, and in Cavite and places like that. So, yeah, they, they got a lot of, uh, uh, some of them were fighting with the 4th Marines. They were on the beaches of Corregidor with the 4th Marines. So, and, and they were, you know, they were part of the United States Navy, but they were, they were, they had reservist status. In the 80s, three-fourths of my electricians on the Midway out of Japan were Filipino. Yep. I had to learn Tagalog to do casualties. There you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> 
Yeah, I got to know a few Filipinos over the years, that, you know, some of whom um, uh, it's been several years since I've been in contact with any of them. But again, it's a really interesting story. And, and again, even though this was a defeat, when you look at the contemporary newspapers like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, and everything, the American public was very proud of this because Singapore fell so quickly, the Dutch East Indies fell so quickly, Hong Kong fell so quickly. These guys in the Philippines held out so long that even though it was a defeat, the public was very proud of what, what happened. It was actually a morale booster to the public because they were, whole, they were doing well at a point in the war where the Japanese were just running amok from one part of the, you know, of the Pacific to another. So the public was proud of the story even though it was a defeat. Sir. Sir, just kind of relating this back to where you started a little bit talking about MacArthur. Is it the sense that, uh, that MacArthur employed the Navy and Marine Corps team effectively or this was done in spite of his? Yeah, his no, th th I mean, uh, unfortunately back, back then in that era, they didn't think of joint ops the way we do today at all. I mean, you know, one of the guys who reviewed my book um, uh, mentioned, um, in fact, he's a CNA, he's an analyst at Center for Naval Analysis who did this review. He mentions how the Army and the Navy were living in separate worlds back then. So the planning between the Army and the Navy was inadequate. Um, MacArthur, uh, as some of you heard before the, the presentation started, you guys, most of you know, MacArthur and the Navy did not get along very well. It all stems from this campaign. Because what was happening was MacArthur was sending all kinds of press releases, many of which he wrote himself. He was in communication with the Secretary of the Army, Mr. Stimson, and Chief of Staff of the Army, General Marshall. And all these problems with the defense of the Philippines, he was trying to blame as much of that as possible on the Navy. And the Navy knew it and the Navy became highly resentful of this. And it really poisoned the relationship between MacArthur and a lot of the admirals. Uh, I, I mean, Admiral King, the Chief of Naval Operations, you know, Admiral, uh, Admiral Stark is, becomes a, like a special aide to Roosevelt, and Admiral King becomes a CNO. Uh, he absolutely despised MacArthur, detested, hated, vit vitriolically hated Douglas MacArthur. And a lot of it was because the feedback he was getting from the Navy guys in the Philippines about what was going on and how, you know, these were MacArthur's problems. When MacArthur left, when he departed in March and Wainwright took command in the Philippines, all the writing I've ever read, all the interviews I did with Navy survivors, they said that the relationship changed dramatically. They said that Wainwright wanted to get as much use as possible out of the Navy and Marine Corps in the Philippines. Um, every Navy account, I've heard this mentioned, they said the relationship it changed like night and day when MacArthur left and, and Wainwright took command. And I, I mentioned that in the book. So, so you're a 1st Battalion, 4th Marines guy. Yeah. Good. How, how much does the regiment remember? Oh, a lot. I mean, every year, we, uh, at least the years I was there, we do, um, usually before like Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, one of these half days, we go and spend uh, four hours just going over the history. Uh, you know, we're still China Marines, call signs China Marines, when I was the officer there, you know, my call signs China 3 from uh, the China time, but then Corregidor is huge into it too, so the Kelly helmet, right. Um, right. still our symbols, so our bull lieutenant carries the Kelly helmet wherever he goes, and then- uh, That's great. We have two sayings really, one is uh, whatever it takes, and the other is uh, hold high the torch. And that's what it's the history of fourth brains, full by the force. Yeah, so right. they take that right. British poem from World War One as part of their morale and captivity in World War Two, saying, you know, hold by the torch. You know, of these guys who died, unfortunately, a lot, you know, a lot of them died of malnutrition or disease, or they're executed by the Japanese, just outright brutality. But, you know, very tragically, and the 4th Marines lost a lot of guys this way out of that 474. Have you guys ever heard of the hell ships? As we were approaching the Philippines, as we were forcing way across the Pacific and closing in on the Philippines in 1944, the Japanese started to evacuate a portion of the POW population back to China or Japan, where they were used as slave labor. Some were still there, some were liberated in the Philippines when we got back, but many were being evacuated. Well, according to the Geneva Convention, Japanese should have told us that there were POWs on these cargo ships. They didn't. So here you're an American submarine, and you see this juicy target leaving Subic Bay, you know, you're going you're to you're torpedo it. Um, 
uh, one, there, there was a, a ship full of POWs getting ready to, in December 1944, we'd already landed at Leyte, the Navy was making carrier raids up on Luzon in the north, and a ship full of POWs was about to leave Olongapo. It was just packed full of prisoners, and Navy dive bombers arrived. And, you know, of course, they had no U.S. Navy dive bombers arrived. They had no idea the ship was packed full of POWs. Uh, a, a Marine lieutenant, a real hero of the 4th Marines, a guy named Hogeboom, uh, he had been a real hero in the campaign, both on Bataan and Corregidor. Um, he was killed, you know, on, on, when this ship, this ship, the Orioka Maru, was dive bombed by the Navy. Of course, they had no idea. So uh, there were three ships, three ships that were sunk, one by airplanes, two by submarines, and about 5,000 POWs died on those three ships. Mostly Army guys, but you know, a lot of sailors and Marines died also on those ships, because again, the, the, you know, the Navy had no idea that these ships were full of POWs. So another tragic aspect of the story. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, I, I was, Quantico, the history division at Quantico was enormously helpful to me. I've given this presentation at Quantico a couple of times, uh, including at the Marine Corps Museum. So uh, again, it's, it, again, it's um, uh, hopefully this Army guy has done justice to the story. I tried my best anyway. Sir. John, thanks so much. We really appreciate your talk today. Very good. And uh, thanks for coming out on November 14th. We hope you'll uh, join us again. Uh, we've got Taylor Kylan coming in and talking about her book, Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. So thank you very much. Spread the word.